the point that we're coming at is that there's a there's a huge shift in 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 the nature of work intelligent systems machines um across the whole value chain are reshaping the way that everything works and entirely new skill sets need to be to be learned and and trained to say to say competitive Robert Schmidt. I am Deloitte's Chief IoT Technologist, also known as Mr. IoT. Today on my Coffee with Mr. IoT, we have Nathan Robinson, the CEO of the Leadership Network. Welcome and how are you doing? Very good. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. It's kind of different time zones, right? I'm having coffee in the morning and for you it's um, the afternoon where you are. Uh, where are you based? You're in London, right? Yeah, we're in London. Um, Sitting here right by the Thames, overlooking Canary Wharf. So um, is it raining? It's a it's an unseasonably hot day. It's thirty degrees. Uh, so yeah, yeah, all good, all good in London. Tell us a little bit about yourself uh, for the people who don't know you. A um, little introduction would be great. Um, and I always love to hear what's your passion. Yeah. Okay. Great. So um, yeah, I'm the CEO of the Leadership Network. So we were a provider of executive training and coaching to global Fortune 2000 companies from uh, from around the world, cross sector, mainly focused on 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 manufacturing and and um, and products across heavy industry, foods, um, pharmaceuticals. Um, so me personally, I've been in I've been involved in learning and coaching um, for for close to 20 years um, and you know recently we've we've been on that journey where we've been looking at how to really change change the game and and, and bring technology and use technology to, to really enhance learning in organizations so so for me i've always been focused and really passionate around around kind of what it, what it takes to to coach people and lead people and recently with all of the um all of the massive advancements in connectivity and technology and data, I think it's, I think it's really the golden age for, for technology and immersive technology. So for, for me, um, I suppose it's a new passion, but immersive technology has, has become you know, my, my every day. And it's, um, yeah, it's a, fa it's a fascinating world. When you say immersive, what does yeah. that mean to you? We're sort of like, where do you draw the line between that's just regular teaching stuff, you know, an electronic whiteboard or, you know, this kind of stuff versus what sort of like really got you excited about immersive? What sort of like the thing that gets you really into it? Yeah, so um, we, our, our business has mainly been focused over the years on, on training people uh, in classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, so sort of eight, eight years ago, we, we went on the journey to, to change and try and make the basic classroom more immersive. So not in a technology way, but you know, in, in a room talking about a major case study and how a company has, 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 um, has made really great impactful change is one thing, but being able to, to take that and, and make people experience it is something else. So, so what we did is we, um, we partnered with companies like Toyota, um, BMW, um, Porsche and, and various other other in, uh, other companies to um, to make the case studies that we used to talk about in classrooms come to life. Um, so, if I take the Toyota example, uh, the Toyota system is revered worldwide and has been for many years. But what what we did is rather than talk about it in classrooms, we went to Toyota and we um, we partnered with Toyota to look around the shop floor, interact with the various different levels of um, management and individuals. Um, so that people could really immerse themselves in 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 why Toyota have have um, achieved what they've achieved over the years. Um, so when when we the natural step from that is when an individual goes to a, a training session like that and or a, or a place like Toyota, they have to then go back to their organisation, and then the real challenge begins: disseminating that information across ten thousand plus people, uh, multiple countries time zones, language, cultures is an incredible job. 
So naturally, we went down the route of thinking about immersive in terms of um, online training um, and went about building an LMS system to do that. But, you know, what we found was that, that, that that's, you, it's very hard to, to, to create something where it creates real feeling in somebody as if they're there. And then for me, I stumbled into, into, into an early, early version of virtual reality. And from that moment, I was, I was absolutely hooked. Um, so at that point, I went around London and bought the last remaining VR HTC headset that was available in, 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 the, in the only shop that I could go in and walk in and find it. I bought a computer to set it up on and about nine different bits of kit. We set that up in our room. Um, we we shut down our e-learning division and we went full into virtual reality. And for me, it was that point when I, when I was able to physically or walk around or digit virtually, so I say walk around a facility, a place, interact with things, pick things up as if I was there, but being in one location for me, that was, that was, that was it. That was, that was really truly immersive. Um, so from that moment, that was, that was um, just over, just over three and a half years ago. Um, so the journey that we've been on is to take that concept and, and turn that into something that businesses all around the world can, can, can really have true simulations in learning where they're, where they're there and they bring people from all over the world and they recreate face-to-face -face in real life immersive training as if, as if they're there. So that, that's, that's what I mean by, by immersive. Hey, whenever I think of yeah, VR, um, one of the things that comes to mind is, is that immersive is one of it but i can actually simulate much much more real situations you know when i was a student when i went to university uh, i had had to do internships and one of the internships was working on a drill rig and you know there's certain safety training that you get from like pictures and so forth but it, it, it gives you a whole different feeling about what happens in an emergency when you have, when you really immersed like this. Uh, what are you doing around that? We see you talked about simulations and so forth. Any great use cases and examples? Yeah, yeah. So, so I suppose our, our training and our, our approach to training is a little bit different. Um, so I suppose the, the point that we're coming at is that there's a, there's a huge shift in, in, in the nature of work intelligent systems, machines um, across the whole value chain are reshaping the way that everything works and entirely new skill sets need to be to be learned and, and trained to say, to say competitive. And these skills that, that are going to bring an organization together and really create an enterprise that's, that's, that's going to compete in the future. Um, I don't think they're taught in classrooms. I think they're required through practice and experience. And what we find is the, the biggest challenge or, or through our experience of where, where major projects fall down or, or fail to, to leave lasting results is in the, in the very sort of organization of people. So it's the, it's the combination of technology and knowledge that runs through a business. That's, that's really the kind of almost like a human nervous system through a business where people are saying and doing the right things in the right way all of the time. Um, and that's what's going to kind of redesign work processes, create new capabilities, and it has to be across the entire value chain. I think if you have excellent training, which is really immersive and detailed in one area, but then huge gaps, um, I think companies are going to have real huge challenges in making um, making enterprise wide changes. So where our training is different is that we focus about applying a full solution, a way of thinking, um, a set of processes, a, a, a whole kind of approach to scaling up a way of working across our entire network. So if I today want to do a learning program with you, um, where do you start then? I mean, you call it the leadership network. Is this sort of like always a program that starts with the leaders and you sort of like work on that, what you call it the nervous system? Um, 
what are some of the things you start with me? I'm sort of like almost like, you know, take me as a guinea pig. Where would you start coaching me and training and leading me? And what would the technology come with that? Sort of like, where do they meet with me? Yeah, so that's a good question. So the um, so there's lots of names used for various different um, people-based systems, lean, operational excellence, then Six Sigma, Agile. So all of our training is around, around these issues. Um, we like to call it enterprise excellence. Um, and the, the, the starting point is, like you said, it's the, it's the top level managers. It's the people who are the, the ones who are going to set the agenda. Um, these are the people who need to, to see it from a strategic level and they need to, 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 to basically create a way of cascading everything down. So um, without going too much into, into jargon, um, so there's a, a Japanese term, which is a core component of lean called Hoshin Kanri. Um, so this, this is kind of where we're starting. So in the most simplest way possible, it's kind of strategic planning coming down through tactical planning and operational performance, where goals and KPIs come down and cascaded properly all the way down and results come up. So really it's about achieving alignment through the goals of the company with the plans of operational management and all the work performed by all employees all works together in a system. Um, seems simple and it seems quite um, intuitive, but in our, in our experience, this is what, this is the level that companies have the, 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 the biggest challenge in instilling company wide. So finding creative ways to be able to permanently support the training all the way through explaining what, what the, the idea is through giving people the tools and techniques and practices, allowing them to simulate environments where they, where they can try this in, 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 in various kind of service or office settings and also on, flax, on factory floor and being able to kind of have a level of permanent resource um, at the highest quality, which is something that um, creates a, a high level of standardization throughout our business. So um, it's all very simple, simple stuff, but doing simple stuff 10,000 times through um, unlimited different processes is, is an extremely difficult thing to do. So what we've done is we've created a, an entire journey which starts at the top and it goes through every element of the system so that people can learn it, practice it, and then permanently coach it through VR. So when I come to one of your trainings, I get a headset? Yeah. So there's the, 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 the training is, um, it's not a one-off session. So it's, um, there's, a, there's a, a part of it which is um, self-paced. So it's like a computer game. It's already created. You walk inside it. It's got various different rooms. It's got a workflow. However, there's a live multi-user VR environment running through it. So for example, if we, wanted, if we were having this conversation in VR right now, We'd both put a headset on and we'd be able to walk around the whole the whole place so if um if we wanted to bring somebody in bring up a 3d model and train them through a specific topic that they have trained on their own in their own time we could then they could learn a specific topic and then we can bring them into the live arena and coach them through it and ask them questions assess them all without traveling hey let me actually i it's funny that you'd say that right behind me i do have one HoloLens 2, what do you that's say? HoloLens. Wow, yeah, yeah. So that's, um, yeah, we, at the moment, ours, ours is Oculus, is Oculus focused, but we are, we are moving into, well, extending it through, through, um, through AR and through the HoloLens, but that's, that's early days for us. I can put my glasses on. So yeah. it's an interesting thing, right? I, I wanted to talk to you about that. So I'm going to only leave it on for a little bit because it's kind of funny. But <laughs> one of the things, I find it comfortable. The nice thing about this one is it's, um, it's disconnected. There's no computer. The computer actually is behind me here in this piece here, right? Yeah. Um, and the battery. So I don't have to be like connected to anything. But one of the things I found is that it takes time to get used to how to do all the gestures and interact with it because it's all gesture based, right? Yeah. You go and you point at stuff, you push it, it knows what your hands do, you pick up things and so forth. But it takes time to actually um, 
learn the gestures. Is that part of your training? What have you found about people learning how to interact with uh, these headsets? Yeah, so that's um, what we what we tend to have at the beginning of any rollout is um, is almost a, a way for people to just experiment. So we quite often put them in games before they start it, um, and the the whole idea is that when especially when when new people are um, introduced to something, it's quite a steep steep jump if you've never had any experience in in, um, in any immersive technology and you're thrown into something quite advanced in in um, in VR or AR and yeah people have to just become familiar with it but what we find is that quite often people are a kind of childlike sensibility comes out they want to they want to pick things up everybody wants to throw something around um, <laughs> yeah, so we usually we usually show them something that's um, yeah just just get used to it so we used to do it for an hour and now we tend to do it for a day um, and even when we're doing demo demos we'll send them a headset in the post so I said the, 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 the Oculus Quest, which is behind me as well. Um, these, these are all wireless as well. Can you show so us? Because that's just big fun to see the difference. So there we go. This is the Quest. So in a nice, convenient box. So again, wireless, light, no, no computer. It's not tethered to anything. It does have hand controllers, but mm, that's, right. that's soon to, yeah. Once everybody catches up with um, with uh, developing the hand gestures, um, they will be gone very soon. So yours. Uh, hang on for a second. I want to show something that's actually interesting for people who haven't really seen this. Uh, one of the differences is uh, the one I have here. It's actually more augmented reality versus virtual reality because it, I still see you through this, right? Yeah. Um, and I can lift this up and do regular work and so work instructions can show up, but they overlay what I see in front of me. Yours is a full on virtual reality, right? Where you actually block out uh, your surrounding environment because it's fully covering your eyes. Is that correct? That's, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So the, yeah, I think the, the real, difference in use cases is that if you're if you're if you're trying to overlay something so for example in design or if you're in product design or within a factory i, I think i can see ar being used to do amazing things um in when we're talking about training entire organizations where you effectively want everybody to be in the same place without having to be physically in the same place i think that's where vr really comes into its own um, so yeah, I, th I think the the the, um, the maturity of VR right now it's it's we're at we're at a real kind of inflection point where the next the next release of the Oculus Quest is going to be cheaper, faster, almost 4K. I think they announced it this week. Um, I think it's due very very soon. And yeah, I think that that the mass adoption of VR is is. Um, well, it's, I, I think, I think, well, and that's, um, that's Facebook and Oculus have got a big, big stake in that. And, um, yeah, we'll see what happens in the next, in the next year or so, but, uh, yeah, it's good. It's, uh, it's exciting times for, for VR. So for sure. I have to ask you the question that's obvious, you know, does that mean you were actually not affected at all by us working from home and remotely because what you offer is collaboration in a virtual world that actually doesn't need us to be close. And so for you, I guess some things have changed, but really for the trainings you offer, it's pretty much the same. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's, um, it's 50, 50 really. So we traditionally, we, we have been a um, training company, a traditional classroom training company. So we started our VR journey three and a half years ago um, because COVID, COVID aside, the, the, the major shift towards um, digital transformation has been, has been happening for a long time. And we were, we were on that journey. Obviously, in the last six months or so, I think we've had years of, years of progress when, when, it comes to, when it comes to digital, digital the way that people um, react and use as standard Zoom and, and um, various other digital things. So it's really propelled us forward. However, it's... You know the the idea of training in rooms internationally right now is 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 on pause. So um, whether whether when and how that's going to come back, 
well that's that's a that's a that's an entirely different different question so we were in a really advantage well we had a really great advantage because we started years ago so i think that our traditional business we've had to pivot very quickly and probably move a little bit faster than we than we than we thought um but yeah our, our existing business kind of finished overnight um which propelled our new business forward so we have transitioned from um physical events to entirely virtual events within three months which is great and now it's now it's a, now it's a, a very strong time for it but we're still in the early stages where where you know there's, there's a lot of a lot of um trial trial and error so 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 it's the it's the beginning of a very exciting phase of learning but it's it is the beginning so i'm curious uh, obviously when since you do training and you really measure how people take content in i've tried to participate and i have participated in quite a few virtual events many conferences for example went online and virtual right and what i've noticed is when i go to a conference i meet people i walk around with people on show floors i have it's just meetings that happen because you run into someone and then you have a half an hour chat about something. Someone walks up to your booth and I have a chat with them. Um, that's not what happens at virtual events. And I find my attention span for those virtual events to be really low. I mean, you got to have some great content or it's got to be really engaging or I'm, I'm going to find something else. It's almost like you know, I grew up in Austria, right? And in Austria, when I had TV, I had two channels. That's it, okay? So, and typically one of the two was not interesting. So there was no channel hopping, but now I have all these choices. So I can go anywhere. And if I'm not interested in something, I hop, and the same thing is true for virtual events. So what's been the best virtual events you have seen and the best way to engage people in these virtual things um, beyond these video calls, which I love, by the way, don't get me wrong. I've seen more people this way than I have otherwise, except traveling. But in these virtual events, what do people need to do to really engage? Not just me, but others. Yeah, that's a really good question. Because um, when obviously the, what happened to us happened to a lot of other events companies and, um, and training companies that like overnight you had to you had to have a solution and the natural solution was to go on Zoom, but it was never this is not fit for purpose for the reasons that you said. Um, so I think the first, the first to answer your question about um, what's the best experience we've, we, uh, I've had is, is you know, obviously I'm very biased because that's what we are doing. We are, doing, <laughs> we are doing a virtual event and, and again, tackling that, that question. So I think the first starting point is to not try and shoehorn something that exists, and just put it into technology. I think the, the whole experience needs to be redesigned. So yes, you're not going to be able to walk through uh, uh, an auditorium and meet people like you can in real life. So, so, but that doesn't mean you can't network with people or meet people in real life. And that's where multi-user VR really comes into it. So, so our masterclasses, so we, we, we have transformed all of our events that we used to host as three-day events in, in the class. We've, we've transferred them into, uh, into virtual reality. Um, so we hosted one with our uh, with our client um, Aptiv in Mexico uh, last week, and um, so there was 50 to 100 people over 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 um, a week, and every single person came from different different places. Um, as long as they had a Wi-Fi connection, they put on their Oculus Quest, um, and they arrive in a room. So much like a real room, the scale is. Obviously, it's bigger because we don't have we're not limited by the physical world, but it's the scale is familiar. So you you're in a place which looks and feels familiar. It's got scale. You can walk around it. You walk up to the um, to the to the entrance room. You choose your room. So we do recreate a little bit of the um, the experience of an event, but then the way that we use the way that we 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 demonstrate concepts or explain um, the actual training material that's where it changes so i think that's the that's what we are trying to do in vr and i think this is what we're doing doing quite well is that we're we're balancing the familiar so that people feel normal and they know they know this they know this is something that they've done before but then really use the 
the um, the full potential of VR by introducing models and explaining things in 3D by kind of creating different rooms where you can jump from one thing to another and that all have different functions and yeah introducing an element of fun and games as well so that people really understand the the the, the or get the full experience um and yeah with some really clever design and good good event management let's call it that then people from all over the world can go to an event and actually participate. And once they finish, they will feel like they've been there because they, they have, they participated in an event. And one of the critical things when you're in there is that there aren't any distractions. So you can't look at your emails or you can't look at your phone. Um, you're, you are fully immersed in it. Um, so yeah, so a true multi-user experience of VR event is, is, is a very different, is a very different experience from a Zoom event. It almost sounds to me like you're creating channels within the environment. So when people naturally aren't interested in one thing, you give them something right there to go to another thing rather than leave the whole event and go somewhere else because it's so easy to go somewhere else. Interesting. And then obviously you talk about the gamification, which leads me to my last question. And that's a bit of a playful question I'm curious about. It's a twofold question. When does gamification... So let me put it this way. Yeah. Um, you know, I work for gaming companies, so therefore games and gamification is really close to my heart. And, you know, I feel it's important that we do way too little in our regular day-to-day -day business. But often it's like, well, that's not business. Mm -hmm. And so where's that line between not enough games and too much games? And then I want to ask you personally, what games do you play? <laughs> So, so yeah, I think the, the, the first question, the, the line between and again, gamification and simulation, I suppose it's a complex, complex question, but when you're talking about gamification in business model terms, I think this is where VR differs from online tech. And I think that that's a, a really big question where it comes down to what, what do you, what do you want to do? And this is where the use case of, 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 of learning and simulation is, is quite different from the kind of business model of gamification, i.e. keeping people locked in and, and wanting more. I think with VR, less is more to a certain extent. So there's, a, there's a, a lot of complexity around there. In terms of the actual experience for the user, I think it's, it's a huge part of it. I mean, the way that people learn and, and how they take things in, um, there's a lot of the studies are, are, are are still quite early for VR, but the the amount of retention when people are enjoying what they do is the amount of re retention of, of, of really important things is extremely high. And um, I don't want to quote any exact figures because they're still still like I said still um, still quite early early in the day. But um, yeah, I think I think the it all has to be value adding. So yeah, the more that people enjoy what they do and they can resonate with what they do, then I think it's um, I think it's um, I think that balance is it, it should be more of a, a more of a choice and that's more of a customized thing but yeah the more the better in my in my view hopefully that answers your question and what games do you play um <laughs> well um very british i only really play fifa so um, ah! <laughs> FIFA football, I've, um i remember the first one first one that came out in 94 and forever i've been um yes yeah, the, one, the one game i play still play with friends and family and uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, FIFA. My son's team is Arsenal and I have no idea why, by the way. I mean, we, he grew up, he was born and grew up in the States. Uh, he played soccer, but um, somehow he decided he roots for FIFA, uh, for Arsenal. And now he gets up in the middle of the night to watch games. And then he tells me when someone is injured and I, I got to read up who they are. Who is your team? Well, I, I, I live I live about um, five minutes away from Arsenal, but I support Manchester Manchester United Manchester United. Yeah, I won't tell my son, but it's uh, it's okay. Manchester menu, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a generational thing. So. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, another coffee with Mr. Artie has come to an end. Um, if you missed any of my previous shows, please check out the playlist. And for future shows, if you're interested to be a guest, let us know. And with that, I'm going to say thank you for watching. And until next time, bye.